It's an honor to stand here with the Assembly of First Nations National Chief. This is a complete victory for children. It strips away any sensibility that First Nations children are being treated fairly by the government of Canada today. And I want to dedicate this, this decision to all of the First Nations children who for years and for decades have been denied an equal opportunity to live the life they wish to have had. And sadly, too often were judged by a Canadian public who didn't know any better as if they got more. And I want to dedicate this decision to the thousands of non-Aboriginal children who have written letters to the Prime Ministers over this last nine years. You see, children may not be experts in politics, but they are experts in love and fairness. And when non-Aboriginal and First Nations children see something that's wrong, they want to do something about it. You know, isn't that our job as adults, is to stand up for kids? I think that's what I find the most shocking at all about this case. I'm a social worker. Why did we have to bring the government of Canada to court to get them to treat First Nations children fairly? Little kids. Why would it ever be okay to give a child less than other children? One of the non-Aboriginal children that we work with said, discrimination is when the government doesn't think you're worth the money. So what would it feel like if you weren't worth the money? What would it feel like if you were the parent of a child who wasn't worth the money? And what's the real price of all of this at the end of the day? You know, First Nations children are more likely to be in child welfare care today than at the height of residential schools by a factor of three. One of the documents that really just struck to my heart was a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. And it counts the number of nights that First Nations children have spent away from their families between 1989 and 2012. And think about it, that's the way your kids think about these things. It's not kind of percentages, it's how many sleeps till I see my mom. And it's over 66 million nights. 187,000 years of childhood. And as the National Chief said, the government of Canada has known that it's underfunding these services. It has connected that underfunding to the growing numbers of children in care because First Nations families aren't given the same supports as everybody else. They've repeatedly had recommendations by joint reports and the Auditor General, and they've not implemented it. I used to do child protection, and um, one of the definitions of maltreatment was that neglect is when you have a parent who knows better and is doing harm for a child and doesn't do better, mm -hmm. that's neglect. And that's what I think is happening here. But it's not just the numbers of children in care growing up away from their cultures. It's the decision by the federal government not to implement Jordan's principle that's created such harm. There is one example that was brought into the decision. A little girl, she's only four years old. She goes in for routine dental surgery. Something horrible happens and she requires critical care. All she needs is some equipment to go home for Christmas. And the government of Canada argued between Indian Affairs and Health Canada for over a month. The Health Canada official finally writes, absolutely not, on the form. Absolutely not. A private citizen had to step in. Another little girl, she's nine years old, and she's at the end of her life. She's tragically one of these children who leaves far too early from us. She was to go home, and all she needed was a bed so she wouldn't go into respiratory distress. Instead of providing that, the government of Canada argued with Health Canada again over who should pay. It took over nine months for that little girl. All mm -hmm. she wanted to do was breathe, and the government wouldn't pay for it. You know, I'm one taxpayer who wants to see reconciliation mean absolutely yes when it comes to children. That's when we really have put this chapter behind us. And, you know, when it comes to residential schools, I think given the misunderstanding of so many people in the Canadian public, they say, well, this, that didn't happen on my watch. So why would people blame me? We don't need to talk about it. Well, this discrimination towards these 163,000 kids is happening on your watch. And some people say, well, you know, it's just, it's just, you can't throw money at the problem. 
That's not going to make it grow better. But throwing money at racial inequality for decades will solve the problem. And it's not just throwing money. These, we have recommendations on the books where the federal government has agreed where that money should be spent, how it should be spent, and how it should be evaluated. And in fact, I've got some of the federal government's own documents right here. They own their own shortfall in funding says $108 million and their PowerPoints at the most senior level of the department. And that falls far short of what children need. If you go onto our website, you're going to find fact sheets, first steps the government could take right now to make that difference. And I welcome the remarks by the ministers this morning. But children only get one childhood. They can't wait for studies. They shouldn't have to wait for studies. The government knows what to do for this generation of children. They just have to get down to doing it. And they know it from their own documents. I pray that we can finally use this as a nation to end the racial discrimination that is happening in this country. This is our Mississippi. And for people that don't understand, First Nations are required to provide, for, uh, follow provincial laws on reserve. But across every area of children's experience, they get less funding because they're funded by the federal government where everybody else is funded by the province. Don't you think that the one thing we can get in reconciliation right is raising a generation of First Nations children that don't have to recover from their childhoods anymore? Who are told absolutely yes instead of absolutely more, no more often? And if we do that, we actually might raise a generation of non-Aboriginal kids that no longer have to say they're sorry when they grow up. And they can actually feel this is a country that believes in fairness and doesn't turn its head away from a whole generation of children in need. Thank you very much.